Hello, I'm Gene Preuss. In this lecture, we'll look at American history from 1968 to about 1980 and how those years changed traditional American culture. We're going to look at the increasing effect that foreign tensions had on American history during the time, looking at calls for greater equality from various groups, and we'll assess the decline of presidential prestige that happened in this time. The courts faced increasing calls to make decisions regarding civil rights, and let's look at four of those. In 1967, a case came up, Loving v. Virginia. Uh, in this case, out of Virginia, a couple, the Lovings, uh, were an interracial couple. And in those days, it was against the law in the state of Virginia to have a black woman and a white man married, or vice versa. And so this was, this was a declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court, thereby opening the way for interracial marriage and getting rid of miscegenation laws. In Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education in 1971, one of the ways the federal courts took up integration was through busing. And what they basically were trying to do was to uh, take black segregated schools, white segregated schools, and mix the students together to achieve some level of integration. And what this meant was taking children out of their neighborhood schools and moving them into schools where uh, they could achieve some balance on racial mixture. And so this was done through busing. And it wasn't very popular. It was seen a, a, a lot of black students and their families didn't like it. Uh, likewise, a lot of white students and their families didn't like it, obviously. Then there was also Roe versus Wade. This was a very uh, famous and important and long-reaching court case that really dealt with women and their medical privacy. But part of the privacy was in the ability of women to consult their doctors about getting an abortion without having a man's input, their husband uh, or their father, for example. And so this idea of women and medical privacy is decided in Roe versus Wade. And of course, this is still a big issue in whether or not women can have abortions. Then there's Miller versus California in 1973, and this redefined what was considered obscene. As far as foreign affairs were concerned, there were problems going on in the Middle East. One of those was in 1967, the so-called Six-Day War. This is where Egypt went to war with Israel uh, and began restricting their shipping. This turned into a full-fledged war, but it only lasted six days. Israel won the war, and Egypt left humiliated. There were continuing frustrations in Vietnam. President Johnson ordered a bombing campaign that came to be known as Operation Rolling Thunder. And this provoked a lot of concern in the United States because of the use of chemicals like Agent Orange and Napalm. Uh, and this increased bombing also put American lives, American servicemen's lives at risk because many of them were affected by these agents and uh, there were carcinogens and uh, soldiers developed cancer and other diseases as a result of Agent Orange and Napalm. In the light of all the growing frustrations in Vietnam, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara resigned in 1967. Uh, President Johnson announced the resignation. And then in January of 1968, a year later, the, during the Vietnamese New Year, Tet, there was a major retaliatory strike uh, from the Viet Cong, the communist troops. Uh, and this left a lot of Americans demoralized and military troops demoralized. We thought... And we had been told in the media and by the president that we were winning the war in Vietnam. And then for them to be able to launch this counterstrike. Now, historically, when we look at this, this was really a last-ditch effort, and, and they were really losing. But it appeared in public perception, to the public's mind, that they weren't. Uh, and so this left many Americans concerned about how long we were going to be in Vietnam, and, and troops were concerned as well. In 1968, in March, the My Lai Massacre occurred. These were American troops went in and massacred a village of people, mostly women, children, and some old men. Uh, and this came out 
at the end of the next year, in 1969 in November, became public. And this also made Americans question about our role in the war and uh, if we were really in there with moral superiority when we were massacring people uh, who were seemingly innocent. In March of 1968, President Lyndon Johnson announced to the nation that he would not run again for office. Um, To many people, this seemed to uh, be a retreat from the defeat he was facing in Vietnam and other problems uh, the president was having uh, with problems within the Democratic Party and civil rights. But if we look at this historically, we can go back and look. Johnson had planned to leave office in 1968 due to health reasons. Uh, He had many heart problems, and in fact, he did die about five years later. Further problems in the United States led many to believe that uh, America was really coming apart at the seams. In 1968, the Kerner Commission, which had been uh, instructed a few years earlier to investigate the long, hot summer riots, race riots going on in major American cities, pointed at white supremacy and segregation as the cause of frustration in black America. And this is why the violence was occurring. Many Americans weren't ready to accept that. There were a couple of assassinations that led to unrest. First, April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King in Memphis, Tennessee, was assassinated while standing out on the uh, balcony of his hotel. You can see the photograph there uh, of the uh, incident. Uh, And in 1968, just a couple of months later, Robert Kennedy, the younger brother of John Kennedy, was also assassinated in Los Angeles. And so you have two assassinations uh, that really rip at the heart of the civil rights movement. In 1968, the Democratic National Convention that met that year in August was also the scene of protests and riots uh, in Chicago. Uh, Police attacked the protesters very brutally, very viciously, and Chicago Mayor Richard Daley was kind of seen as um, uh, encouraging that and uh, signing off on those attacks of police against the protesters. And in speaking of protests in 1968, uh, the Olympics, uh, you see the picture here on the right, of uh, two Olympic uh, uh, medalists, a gold medalist and a a silver uh, medalist, who uh, raised their hands with a black power salute. Uh, This is part of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, but uh, many people saw this... um, as disrespect for the Olympics and disrespect for the sports, and so they were uh, criticized for this. Uh, as I mentioned in the last lecture, you also had the Tate LaBianca murders, the Helter Skelter murders, as they're sometimes called by the Charles Manson family uh, or cult that happened in 1969. As far as women were concerned, uh, feminism and equal rights, the movement continues. Uh, 1968 in September, there was a protest of the Miss America pageant. Many women believed that this was basically um, uh, objectifying women. Uh, So you had a group called the New York Radical Women's that uh, protested outside the Miss America pageant, throwing away items that they believe oppressed women. Uh, Ironically, at the same time, there was also the first ever black Miss America pageant, or Miss Black America pageant, that was held nearby. Uh, And it was held because it was a segregated event. Blacks were not allowed to participate in the whites-only Miss America pageant. And so... Uh, At the same time, you had protests from women who felt that this was objectification of women. You also had African-American women who were participating in the first black uh, America, Miss America pageant. As far as the Equal Rights Amendment was concerned, it did pass Congress in 1972. The states had seven years to ratify, uh, and only 35 had ratified by 1977, not enough for it to become an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. There was a lot of conservative opposition. I mentioned Phyllis Shapley Shapley before uh, and her organization Stop ERA, but also there was religious objections to it from conservative religious leaders like Jerry Falwell. 
On July 20th, 1969, the world watched as televisions around the world broadcast the moon landing of Apollo 11 landing on the moon. And um, this intensified people's concern about the fragility of the world uh, and Earth and the environment. And concerns over pollutions were exacerbated. Look, in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, the Hoyga River caught fire in 1969. Uh, because of pollutants and uh, waste being thrown into the river. Now, this, in fairness, wasn't the only time that river caught fire. Uh, and it was a horribly polluted river. But this brought attention to the fact uh, that we needed to do something to protect the environment. In 1970, they instituted the first Earth Day. And also that same year, the National Environmental Policy Act was passed, which established the Environmental Protection Agency. It uh, There was a campaign called Keep America Beautiful that resulted from this. And in 1972, you have the Clean Water Act. When LBJ announced that he wouldn't run again for president in 1968, his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, ran on the Democratic ticket, as opposed to former Nixon vice president, Richard Nixon, who ran for the Republicans. Nixon won the election and... One of his promises during the campaign was that he had a secret plan to get us out of Vietnam. Uh, and some people have joked that the secret plan was he had no plan at all. In reality, what Nixon wanted to do was end the war soon. And so one of the things that he uh, instituted was what was called Vietnamization. And this was the simple idea of putting American troops, replacing them with Vietnamese troops. Let Vietnam take care of of its own uh, internal politics. But he did, at the same time, increase bombing in the neighboring country of Cambodia because uh, he believed, uh, because sources had shown that Vietnamese were using the Cambodian mountains uh, as a route, and so Nixon started bombing this other country. This led to college protests at various colleges around the United States and at Kent State in 1970. Uh, this image on the right-hand side is from uh, when protesters um, were attacked, were shot at by National Guard troops uh, who feared the protesters were getting out of hand. Somebody fired a shot, and several protesters were killed. This is a so-called Kent State Massacre. But uh, this also happened uh, at Jackson State in Mississippi as well. In 1971, the Supreme Court took up the case, New York Times versus the United States, uh, over what was called the Pentagon Papers. These were documents uh, that had been uh, kind of classified between uh, the Pentagon and uh, the, the the government, the uh, the White House and whatnot, uh, talking about how the war was going on and details about the war. The New York Times got a hold of some of these documents, wanted to print them. The United States tried to stop them. The Supreme Court said that we needed a free and unrestrained press and allowed the New York Times to print the Pentagon Papers. And what this showed was that um, that there was a lot more going on in Vietnam that Americans felt that they were led to believe, and they felt that they were um, kind of misguided by the administration, by the by the military. And so this further ca led to calls for more uh, a more quick retreat from Vietnam, for getting American troops out of Vietnam. And so Nixon began this winding down uh, the war powers resolution that uh, LBJ had gotten uh, expanded during the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was rescinded. Uh, that You had the Paris Peace Accords going on in 1973 to try to broker a truce between the United States and Vietnam. And finally, in April of 1975, the U.S. withdrew its troops from Vietnam fully. Speaking of uh, President Nixon, in 1972, he was up for re-election. And Nixon ran on kind of what was called the Nixon Doctrine. And this was his foreign policy, which was led by his Secretary of State and Foreign Policy Advisor, Henry Kissinger. Uh, and 
Henry Kissinger believed in a policy that he called detente. And this was kind of an, an old policy from the 1870s uh, European uh, power politics that was called realpolitik. And what it was was, you know, uh, showing a force and, and building up of forces in order to get people to the bargaining table. Uh, Nixon did take advantage of this detente, this kind of brokering of a peace and an agreement uh, not to go to war. Uh, he was the first president ever to go to communist China, and he went there in 1971. And he had other foreign successes, too. He went to Russia in 1972, uh, so he visited to communist country. He began negotiating treaties with the Soviets and the Chinese uh, over uh, ballistic missiles, the ABM treaties, and SAW treaties, strategic arms limitation talks, uh, won the first treaty in 1972. And so when he was up for re-election, uh, one of his big opponents uh, was the Democrat George Wallace. George Wallace, you may recall, was governor of Alabama and a staunch segregationist uh, using the Southern strategy. There was an attempted assassination on Wallace in May of 1972. He was left... Um, wounded and he used a wheelchair paralyzed uh, for the rest of his life. Also, as a part of the re-election, it was discovered that uh, in the Watergate office building in Washington, D.C., the Democratic National Convention office was broken into. And research showed links between the burglars, the Watergate burglars, and the President's Re-Election Committee, the Committee to Re-Elect the President, also known with the unfortunate initials as CREEP. The Watergate break-in and investigations into the break-in led to the Washington Post and the New York Times beginning a series of uh, conversations with a secret informant they called Deep Throat. Now, they didn't reveal the name of the informant, but they used the name of a pornographic movie title to uh, to identify their informant. This deep throat gave them information that they printed in the newspapers that eventually led to uh, congressional investigations in January 73. The Senate began inviting Sam Irwin, uh, a Democratic senator from North Carolina, began uh, televised investigations that summer. What we found out was that Nixon had been taping conversations in the White House. And what that meant was that um, there may have been information on those tapes that could have implicated or possibly exonerated the president. The real question was, what did the president know and when did he know it? And so they were going after these tapes to listen to them to find out what those meetings were about, who Nixon met with, uh, and what information he was given. Did the president help cover up a crime? If so... That is a high crime and misdemeanor, and therefore he could be impeached as a result of it. The Supreme Court ordered Nixon to give those tapes up. Uh, when they did, and when uh, the committees listened to those tapes, there was a mysterious 15-minute uh, blank piece of tape where uh, Nixon's secretary said she accidentally recorded over uh, that conversation. Later that year... The so-called Saturday Night Massacre, Nixon ordered the Department of Justice to fire the special prosecutor looking into the burglary and the president's role in the burglary. When the Justice Department refused to fire the special prosecutor, Nixon replaced uh, the uh, head of the Justice Department, uh, and this uh, led to other problems for Nixon. Finally, on July 30th of 1974, the House Judiciary Committee voted articles of impeachment against the president, and in order to avoid what was almost surely going to be a conviction by the Senate, the head of the Republican National Committee at that time, uh, a young man named George Herbert Walker Bush, went to Nixon's office and told the, Nix, told the president that he really should resign. Nixon took his advice, and on August the 9th, 1974, in order to avoid the impeachment trial, Nixon resigned. He was replaced by his vice president, 
Gerald R. Ford, and in September, a month later, President Ford issued Nixon a pardon so that he could never be brought up on charges related to the impeachment. This really soured a lot of Americans on the Republican Party um, and uh, politics in general. And so when they went to vote in the 1976 elections, they wanted an outsider. And they found that in the Democratic nominee, James Earl Carter of Georgia. When Carter came into the presidency, he was facing problems that he, Gerald R. Ford, before him, and even Nixon had started to face before he left office. One of these was the economic decline. A part of this was as a result of the amount of money we're, we're spending fighting the Vietnam War, but also the fact that Europe had started to rebuild from the ravages of World War II, and so their economy was up and going too. So basically, it was kind of an early form of globalization that was hurting the United States economy. The cost that we were fighting in the Cold War our own stalled economy led to increasing unemployment and rising inflation. Uh, so much so that Nixon uh, was forced to take the United States off the gold standard in order to try to correct and stem that rising inflation. On top of that, in 1973, the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East declared a oil embargo. The oil producing export countries, OPEC, declared an oil embargo on the United States uh, and this was in retaliation for our support of Israel during the Six Day War and also as a result of another war that happened in 1973 uh, sometimes called the Arab-Israeli War or Yom Kippur or sometimes a Ramadan war uh, of October that Israel also won the United States supported Israel. So this was a retaliation, and it led to uh, problems uh, with American refineries getting crude oil and therefore no oil at the pumps. And so you would see signs like you see on the right-hand side. These were very common during the 70s, and the price of oil started going up because of our growing dependence upon foreign oil. Manufacturing jobs in the Midwest were also facing a hit as well. Uh, a lot of the big three auto manufacturers were moving to plants in the South and in the so-called Sun Belt, the Southwest. Part of this was because uh, they were building and implementing new forms of mechanization uh, that they then brought to those plants in the South where they were able to pay lower taxes and they also had stronger laws against unions, so unions were weaker in the southern and southwestern states, therefore driving the price of, um, uh, of the employees down. In the midst of these problems, there was conservative backlash. Uh, and many people were wondering if civil rights had gone too far. You see groups like the Heritage Foundation in 1973 is a conservative think tank and their mandate for leadership that they published in 1981. Also another conservative, more of a libertarian group, uh, the Cato Institute and their publication, The Libertarian, uh, questioning uh, the movement of civil rights. And although this was not, this next incident uh, was really not related to civil rights, many saw that it was. Um, Jim Jones, the fellow you see here with the sunglasses, was the leader of a church, uh, a, a Protestant uh, Pentecostal church that he called People's Temple. And uh, it, they started off in the Los Angeles community, uh, reaching out uh, to a lot of African American and other minority groups. Um, Believing that the United States would not end its level of segregation, he and his followers moved to Jonestown, Guyana, in South America. And there, this is where we get the term drink the Kool-Aid from, uh, because there were a mass suicide. He predicted the end of the world, and he said that the only way they could get out of this is, was by suicide. Uh, and so this was a terrible, terrible incident and many people believed uh, that it was kind of tied to the civil rights movement, kind of excesses of some of the civil rights movement. 
You also see the growth of political action committees. This is a new animal in the 1970s, and these were uh, groups that could pool their money and support candidates of their choosing. You also see uh, the growth of a group called neocons, neoconservatives. A lot of these people were former liberals who felt that uh, liberalism didn't win, didn't go the right direction. Uh, some of these were strong cold warriors, and so you're going to see uh, this some parts of this mentality reflected in their policies and in their actions uh, in later years. While he was president, Jimmy Carter faced a lot of opposition, some from his own party. Uh, you had liberal Democrats who didn't think that he was going far enough. He was challenged by Robert and John Kennedy's youngest brother, Ted Kennedy, uh, for the primary. Uh, Kennedy lost. Uh, Carter retained that. Uh, and he was also... There were also what you would call Reagan Democrats, and these were more conservative, more traditional Democrats. Some of these people were farmers. Uh, farmers uh, were seeing a lot of farm foreclosures in the late 1970s, uh, again, because of growing crops in Europe and the revitalization of the European economy, basically what we would call globalization today. A lot of American farms uh, faced a lot of problems. There was also a, a boycott uh, on the Soviet Union, and we'll talk about this later on, for um, invading Afghanistan in 79. And so we refused to sell American wheat to the Soviets, and this also hurt American farmers. So in 1978 and 1979, American farmers took their large tractors to Washington, D.C. to protest. This became known as Tractorcade. Carter, in 79, also issued a speech that he called the crisis of confidence, and he was talking about uh, how Americans weren't sure if they trusted the government. But this kind of became known as the Malays speech, and many people said that uh, in this Malays speech that Carter uh, was... Um, not very optimistic, and so they criticized him for this. There was, there was also problems going on in the American Southwest. The Carter administration lost some support from others who might have voted for him, and these were Mexican-American voters. Because of police brutality in the Southwest, namely Texas, New Mexico, and somewhat in California, in 1975 to 1980, that Carter... Uh, did not really do anything about, sent the Justice Department to investigate, but nothing was really done about it. And and this put a bitter taste in the mouth of many uh, Mexican-Americans who would have voted for Carter and would have voted Democrat, but began changing their allegiance as a result of this. On the other hand, you had the rise of Christian conservatives. And be, these were people who advocated for traditional family values. They were against abortion. They were against this, the rights that uh, the LBGTQ movement, the Stonewall Rebellion, had ushered in. They were anti homosexual. Uh, they uh, decried divorce. They thought divorce was getting too easy. They were upset about prayer, what they conceived as prayer being taken out of schools, um, uh, and other things. And some of these so-called evangelicals, as they kind of came to be known, one of the things that really um, prompted them to, to get upset, although this isn't talked about very much, was that Many of their private schools were segregated, uh, and institutions like Bob Jones University uh, refused to integrate. And so the Internal Revenue Service ended their tax-exempt sat status. Uh, now, this was seen as an attack on freedom of religion, the freedom to segregate. And so uh, evangelicals began turning against the Democratic Party as a result of this, in 1977, a family-oriented group called Focus on the Family, led by Jim Dobson, a psychologist, uh, began talking about more traditional family values. They established a public policy uh, organization and also political action committee around called the, the Family Research Council in 1981. And you had the rise of Jerry Falwell's organization, The Moral Majority. 
and uh, Concerned Women for America, uh, which also f- uh, focused, besides ERA, on uh, abortion, uh, voting rights, and, and women's rights. But from a conservative viewpoint, uh, they were anti-abortion. Uh, they had thought women's rights movement had gone too far, and they start criticizing the Democrats and Carter as well. So he's got opposition from not only his own party, the Democrats, but a growing opposition from evangelicals, conservatives, uh, and the Republicans. Finally, it was foreign affairs that continued to plague the Carter administration in 1979 in Iran. The rule of the Shah uh, was overthrown by a uh, religious-led organization, conservative traditionalist religion, led by uh, the Ayatollah Ruallah Khomeini. Uh, The Shah of Iran had been supported by the United States government since 1953, and uh, when the Shah fell ill with cancer and came to M.D. Anderson uh, for treatment, uh, President Carter had given the Shah sanctuary. Well, when the Ayatollah led a rebellion, Um, A lot of them were college students. They invaded the American embassy in Tehran and took Americans hostage. They held 52 of them. They released a few, but for 444 days, they held Americans over a year as hostages. And the nightly news reported on this, uh, and there were attempts to rescue them, uh, but nothing really happened. Uh, Finally, Saddam Hussein, the uh, leader of Iraq, ordered an an invasion of Iran, uh, and he forced Khomeini to negotiate. In 1979, the Soviet Union, as I mentioned earlier, invaded Afghanistan, and there was a grain embargo, which did hurt American farmers. And so it was these problems that were abroad that also led to problems. Now, Khomeini did agree to negotiate, did finally agree to release the hostages, but not while Carter was president. And so, in the 1970s, we see increasing foreign tensions. Uh, And a lot of this was as a result of the Cold War, uh, especially those in Vietnam. And this led to increasing mistrust of the government. Also, many Americans wanted more equality, but others felt that we had gone too far. And we find out that uh, in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, the faith of the American people in their president declined tremendously. And this mistrust in the government and the belief of presidential corruption led to a decline in confidence in our American presidency. I want to thank you very much for listening.